Okay, so welcome everybody to, I don't know how many programs we've had had um, this winter, Mary could probably tell us, but thank you for joining us for, we have a new name for this program. You know, it's been called the Weekend Educational Weekend Equestrian Program, which started a long time ago. And obviously it's not on weekends anymore. So we've come up with the name of D for K Up. And D for K Up stands for D for K Unmounted Programs, which covers the various non-riding things that we do. And I wanna thank very, very much Susan Sieber, Carol Baker, and of course, Mary Livernoir, who do the organizing. I just hop on when it's time to do the Zooms. I really have very little to do with it otherwise. Also a huge thank you to Trafalgar Square, who uh, of course sell horse books, who's been a sponsor of D4K almost from the very beginning. And you know, this is our 25th year wow. of D4K. Also the Connecticut Dressage Association, which helps to support this program. Uh, June 12th, put that on your calendar. Uh, the postponed talk with Laura King will be happening. And uh, I think that's something you all want to think about. She's absolutely fabulous. She works with the mental preparation of some of our top, top riders, um, even our Olympians. And um, so that'll be on June 12th. If anyone has any questions at any time during the talk tonight, write them in the chat. Um, if you don't know to how, how to find the chat, look around. <laughs> um, anyway, let's start tonight talking about colleges and getting into colleges and what you can expect at colleges. Uh, we're very fortunate to have a, a diverse group. I'm excited about that. Uh, starting with Beth Bukema from Rehoboth, Massachusetts and Wellington, Florida, where she's still riding her horses and freelance teaching. She's the former director and Debar department chairperson of the equine study programs at Johnson and Wales University. She's the founding president of the Intercollegiate Dressage Association and is still on the board as president emeritus. She's currently on the New England Dressage Association board. She runs the amazing fall symposium for the New, York, New, England, Dressage, um, New England Dressage Association. And we're very excited about having Kira Kirkland there this fall. Um, she's a Balamo balance and motion balance in motion trained instructor and works with riders, particularly on biomechanics of riding and improving their seat. She's a USEF licensed official that she's been for over 40 years and judged all over the East Coast. So that covers the dressage part of it. I am personally very excited to have Mimi Roten, who's the director of riding and head, head NCEA coach at Sweetbar College. I'm, I did my four years at Sweetbar College. And then after uh, graduating, I taught there for three and a half years. Um, so it's kind of special to me, but it is a hunter program as opposed to dressage that most of the rest of us have been doing now. Um, she has a BA in psychology. She's a USEFR judge, hunter judge, an American uh, National Riding Commission recorded judge and holds the a American Riding Commission top rider rate rating. She's also a US Hunter Jumper Association certified trainer and credentialed instructor. As a coach, she's Mimi has coached individuals and teams at the national and regional level in NCEA. You mean what's NCEA? National Collegiate Riding Association. Okay. Uh, <laughs> IHSA, the Intercollegiate Horse Shows Association. Yes. ODAC is the uh, what's Old ODAC? Dominion Athletic Conference. Old Dominion, yes. Old Dominion Athletic Council and the American National Riding Commission format. Mm -hmm. She enjoys teaching and training riders of all level and believes that what she teaches and coaches translates into other areas of life. A quote from Mimi, positive coaching helps young women become strong competitors in sports and in all aspects of life by setting goals, working towards developing skills and schooling a horse. A rider requires an understanding of the time, effort and dedication needed to achieve success. These principles can be applied to a student's academic work as well as their future endeavors. And I am leaving out several paragraphs worth 
of the students and teams that Mimi has coached to regional and national championships. Anyone that wants it, I'll share it, but it's too long to share right now. So I was approached, I did a clinic in um, Las Vegas a couple years ago. And, and after that clinic, one of the young ladies in the clinic, Georgia Vigo, approached me and said she would like to see a presentation. She would like to do a presentation about applying to colleges and what you need to think about, about applying with riding in mind. She's a graduating senior of the class of 2023. She started riding when she was 12 and is a USDF bronze medalist. But she also rides as well as dressage, Western eventing and jumpers and has been in the varsity open division of IEA the last couple of years. She's recently placed in both, the, she's placed in both of the last nationals and is the national dressage representative and a team captain for region 10, which is out west somewhere. My, her goal is to inspire and pr promote positivity in this community while helping others grow. So I wanna thank Georgia for having the initiative to come to me and say, let's do this. So with no further ado, uh, as long as I haven't forgotten anything that Mary will poke me about, um, I turn this over to Georgia first. Hi everyone, hope you're having, I think a good night. It's more of a good afternoon over here. Um, but I actually just had my last day of high school today. So this is uh, really exciting going into my new chapter of life. So I um, am going to share my screen with you as I've prepared a presentation. So let me just go ahead and do that. Go away. Okay. Um, okay, so I can just get started. Yes, go for it. Okay. And I'm, I'm muting myself. Okay. Um, so applying to college as an equestrian. Let's see if my computer will work and let me move to the next slide. Okay. So there's a lot of factors that you should consider when you go to college. And I think that was probably the most difficult for me um, going in was deciding what college I wanted to go to um, and basically what needs there were, right? Because you want to consider the education level that you want to have or the financial needs, especially the financial needs um, because college is expensive and you probably don't want to be in debt for the next 35 years of your life. Um, you also want to determine the extracurriculars and location. And so these are just some of the important factors um, in terms of what you should consider when you're applying to college. Uh, there's also if you want to ride um, and then is it available to ride there? For example, U Chicago does have a riding team, um, but it is in the middle of the city. So not the best environment. So those those are a lot of factors that you want to consider when you go to college. Um, so when should you start? Um, I think it would be best to start be like beginning of um, the summer after junior year or even midway through junior year. Um, I think it's important to start researching uh, colleges and what you want. Um, I think that's the hardest part is deciding where to go. And applying is easy once you decide where you want to go. Um, and I think you should, it's hard to choose a lot of options when you're in college, um, but I definitely think it would be important to start sooner rather than later. Um, college is a long process. It's a new chapter of your life. It's your big decision and you want to have time to think about it. Okay, so how many college, colleges should you apply to? Um, I like to think that better options is, um, oh, sorry, more options is better than no options. Um, you'd rather have couple on your hand than none at all. Um, that being said, don't be one of those people who applies to 35 colleges and has to choose between 30 colleges to apply it to. Um, that is way too many. But here's kind of the breakdown of the schools that you should apply to. Obviously, this is fluctuating per student. Um, and I got this from multiple resources um, in equestrian and outside of equestrian. So uh, if you wanna have a couple of reach schools, a couple of target schools, safety, and then of course your backup schools. And then that's generally how many colleges you should apply to. It should be 
um, in the teens somewhere. Uh, 20 plus is a bit excessive, but under 10, it doesn't leave you with a lot of options. Okay, so how to realize how you want to ride in college. Um, there are a couple options. You have your D1 teams. This is fully committed NCAA. These are going to be your teams that require a lot of time and commitment into riding. Um, these are the most competitive and intense. This is going to be outside training. Um, there's going to be practice at like five to six days a week. Um, and it's going to be probably sponsored by the school. So it's not going to be as expensive, um, but it is going to be very time consuming and it's going to be a lot of writing and you won't be able to focus on as much school as you would as D2 and D3, which is still um, very varsity, but it's, as you go down the levels, it gets a uh, less and less competitive. Um, and it goes from somewhat competitive, more competitive, but you're still going to expect um, a lot of riding. And then you have your club team, uh, clubs riding, which is basically just riding. Um, sometimes they'll compete in I just say, um, sometimes they won't, but it also does mean that the school doesn't really sponsor club teams. So you're going to have um, a little bit more money on your hand, um, but it does give you more time and flexibility. And for that, I'm actually going to turn to Mimi to talk about um, NHSA and NCAA or NCEA. Thanks, Georgia. Um, so a couple of things just, and, and you've done a great job here. There's so much information and, and it's hard to kind of condense it. So I appreciate your work on this one. Um, the NCEA is one that um, is available actually at all levels, D1, D2, D3. So, um, and same thing with IHSA will sometimes be in all levels as well as as a club. Um, and we're a division three school. So we do the NCEA. Um, differences are like you said, how a sport is sponsored by their school. So if it's considered a varsity sport, then they will probably have a whole lot of funding. That might be like Georgia said, in combination with then some requirements that you have to do um, as a part of the team. So um, for some schools, they might have like mm, hours caring for the horses. Um, and for other schools, they might just have riding time in the saddle or even going to the gym. So um, those things there. The, both the NCA and the IHSA are sort of luck of the draw format in terms of um, you go to a host school and you get to pick a horse out of the hat and that's who you ride. Uh, the major difference there is in NCA, it's usually one team against the other. So it's a head to head. Whoever rides that one horse better wins a point for their team. Um, and the IHSA, there's multiple teams together at one time vying for places like in a normal horse show. So um, hopefully that helps. Thanks, Georgia. Okay, and so actually um, she covered it, but here are some of the differences um, between IHSA and, and um, NCEA. So on the left is going to be IHSA. Um, all, the classes actually range about the same amount. Um, NCAA is going to be a little bit more intense than IHSA. Um, you can read through, but just uh, there's kind of a bunch to it. If you are a male rider, you cannot ride in NCEA. Um, unfortunately, it is a woman designated sports, just like we have women swimming. Um, only horseback riding or equestrian is only a woman's sport in NCEA, unfortunately. Um, NCEA does have more scholarships than IHSA, um, which is a very important factor if you're determining money. Uh, but you also have to be pretty good to get a scholarship in the equestrian community. Um, and then you guys can read through. Okay, so we're going to move on to the next slide. Okay, so there is quite a balance between the equestrian and academics. It's very challenging um, if you want to go to school more suited for riding and try to balance the academics. For me, um, I wanted to go to a school with kind of prestigious academics, but also have riding and then I realized like I couldn't have the best of both worlds so you're really just going to have to make a compromise um so and a couple of things about riding is you want to be able to have good academics because if you don't have good academics they might take riding away from you so don't plan to go to school just to ride and then 
slack off during school, you have to have good time management. Um, and then same with being an equestrian, if you're going to board your horse on campus, or if you're going to bring a horse, your time commitment is going to be way larger um, than a regular person who rides maybe once to twice a week. And grades are so important, as I mentioned above. And I'm actually going to ask Beth if she can talk a little bit about some equine related majors. Okay. Um, first, I want to say that you also have Intercollegiate Dressage Association in there. Um, and Intercollegiate Dressage Association schools vary very much. You can have fully funded uh, teams um, at most of your equine major schools, such as, you know, Emory and Henry, Centenary, JW, e Averett, they have totally funded equine uh, dressage teams so that you can, you know, you're, you're, not a, you're not a club sport. And then the others have club sports at them. Um, so that they're, the, the IDA is also um, part of it. And you go to teamdressage.com to find the IDA members. And the teams will vary very much um, and from, you know, a four person club team to, you know, a 15 person um, fully funded, funded team. For the academics, I would say pick the school that's right for you academically, that is going to fit your needs academically first, and then the equestrian afterwards. If you want to be an equestrian major, there's many different ways to go. You can go to a major state land grant university, say UNH, UMass, University of North Carolina, um, University of Georgia. These have varying different programs. Some of them are club sports, some of them have fully funded, many of them have IHSA teams, some have um, NCAA based teams like Texas A&M. The reason they have those um, NCAA teams, there's only 26 in the country, is that they need to balance out their football rosters. So those you'll find at the major large football um, schools. Some schools are NCAA, but they don't compete as NCAA teams. They compete in the regular IHSA divisions like Brown. So Brown follows all the NCAA rules. They have a hunt seat team, but they ride under in the IHSA instead of going head to head with the NCAA. So they're, they're different even within those NCAA teams there are different approaches. The Ivy Leagues aren't allowed to give um, scholarships for athletics. It's not allowed in any Ivy League institution. So you will not find Brown or Dartmouth, even though they might have riding teams, they will give you an academic scholarship. And if you can get in, you're gonna get financial aid. Um, those, those Ivy Leagues, those top tier schools are very well funded. You, they put a financial aid, if you can get in, they'll put a financial aid package for you. So don't, if you're at that top academic tier, don't be shy about applying because they will put a financial package together that's good for you, all right? Um, and then your other tier schools, find out really what you're interested in, in majoring. Or do you want to be a science major? Do you want to be a business major? Do you want to be more general studies, uh, maybe in education? Um, and then if you want to be a equine major, find out what aspects of the industry you might be interested in. Will you be interested more in the pre-vet program? Will you be in interested more in um, working for a, a salary company or a lot of people go into marketing of equine products. That, that's a very popular field. So a business background with the equine degree would be helpful for that. If you want to go into teaching, then there's most of your equine degrees will give you methods in, of riding instruction and give you practice teaching. If you want to go equine assisted therapy, then look for a program that will get you path certification at the end of it so that you can go out. And then also, if you're looking for something like equine assisted therapy, you also have to think you'll be working for a nonprofit. So you want to get, have some administrative courses, have some nonprofit courses, have some courses on grant writing, because you're going to be having to raise the funds. And as you move up the level from an instructor to an administrator, you want the background to be able to write grants and to 
uh, work in the nonprofit uh, sector. And so that would be an, important for you. If you want a breeding program, then sometimes your um, larger state universities like Colorado State, Texas A&M might be the right place for you because they have research herds that they do a lot of breeding and you can get some hands-on breeding experience. Uh, so there's many different routes to take. Um, I would say pick your school that ac you're academically going to be comfortable in and then look at what, your ma what major you want, whether you want equine or non-equine. You don't have to be an equine major to get into the equine, um, get an equine career. Sometimes it's right for some, sometimes it's not right for the other. If financially you're really strapped and you have a horse at home that you can fit, you know, keep at home. You can also think about going to a, a local community college for a year and then transferring in. So you get all your base general studies courses out of the way at a very low cost and then transfer in. You generally will need three years at an institution to complete a degree to get them out, to get residential uh, credits in, in line. So that's something to think about. If you're really saying, oh, it's really, really a reach for me to go to this expensive college, do a year at a community college and, and then decide which college is uh, the right transfer for you. And that can save you some, some money. But don't be afraid to apply to a college and look for financial aid. There is a lot of financial aid out there. So does that help? Yep, thank you. I would, um, adding on, uh, you can always appeal for financial aid. They can give you a package and you can say, this is not going to work for me. And obviously write why it won't work for you. Um, and usually they'll try and work with you or they'll send you some scholarships to apply to on the financial aid basis. So um, I think it's important to maximize potential to go into writing or even for recruitment purposes. So I'm going to go through and I'm just going to go down this list. Um, videos are super important. A lot of um, recruiters or just people that are looking at your writing, look at these videos and it doesn't have to be like top rated show videos. They just kind of want to see how you ride. So when you're riding, take lots of videos. It's going to come in handy in the future. Um, it's also important to go to shows. Um, I know shows are super expensive. Um, so even just some schooling shows, just especially for dressage, get the scores. Then you can show them when you're going into IDA, look, I have scores in second level at blank. I have scores in first level at blank. And then they kind of can see um, what type of rider you are. Also riding the A circuit, if you can afford it, it's really expensive, but it's really important for if you want to be in the college big leagues for equestrian. Um, and riding in the A circuit will get your name out there. Um, a little bit to talk about resumes. If you have been riding, um, it's important now that you can like list all of your accomplishments, all the awards you have, just start listing them down um, as you go along. Cause it's gonna be a lot harder to go look back and be like, okay, what show did I go to that weekend? And what place did I get? And if, so if you, after a show, go on the Google Doc and just write down what you got or have it on a piece of paper. That way, when you're applying to college, and I swear they will ask you, what accomplishments have you gotten in writing? Every single questionnaire I've applied to. And then you can just copy and paste that in, and it makes your life so much easier. Um, and then you can also tell your team what strengths you can bring, what you're usually good at. So if you're win first and flat every time, probably should mention that. Um, reach out to coaches. I think that's really, really important. Um, see what they kind of expect from a rider. So if you're kind of right now in the freshman, sophomore, or even junior phase, um, you can strengthen up your riding to what team or caliber you want to meet. So um, if they have a specific, like if you really have a dream college in mind, go reach out to them and kind of see what their like regimen is. And then you can train for their team. Um, and that way you can kind of go in expecting um, what it's gonna be like. So as I said, and then um, also know what schools you're looking for. Sorry, go ahead, um, Beth. Uh, uh, one thing I would like to say on competition, the coaches in IDA and IHSA 
would like you to be the best rider with the least competitive experience. Reason being, they can put you at a lower level and you'll be a shoe in for points for the team. So going in, trying to stretch and show second level means that you're gonna to have to be a first level rider. They might already have three first level riders. They'd love you to be an upper training rider because you've only ridden first, first level. You've only competed at first level. So don't necessarily make that stretch for the next level, you know, be a goal. So be the, have the goal being the good, correct riding. And then they're gonna put you at a team at a lower level and you're gonna be a great point rider for the team. And that's both IHSA and IDA. It's not for um, NCEA because they are all riding at just one level. But when you have the gradations of levels, they want you to qualify as low as possible, but be the best rider. <laughs> So that is a sort of trick to get on a team is that you haven't ridden that second level. <laughs> and I will, I'll agree with you there, Beth, that um, you definitely want to have the most experience you can get. Um, doesn't always mean that you have to go to the A shows and for, I don't know whether it's for IDA, but I suspect it is because it's similar to IHSA. There is a point that if you go to a rated show, you tip into another level even if you aren't successful at it, if it's a rated show and say you go and do short stirrup at the rated show, you've attended a rated show. And so you've bumped into that other level. So you have to be careful of that. And, and I'll go with, Very correct. with the NCEA. You again, want to have good skills and that catch riding piece. So I've been super successful with our NCEA team and winning national competitions in that form with students that came in in the IHSA in a novice or intermediate level since they changed names. So not at the open level. And those were just young ladies that had not had um, the horse that could take them farther or the financial means. So um, they had been scrappy and gotten lots of good experience riding a variety of horses and that's what sort of collegiate riding is about. So, um, but but great great extra things to remind everybody of. Right, and it is super important that you don't just skip levels because you have the horse to do it. You don't want your horse to kind of bring you there. Um, make sure you ride as many horses as you can, and I can't stress that enough. If there's horses at your barn that need to be ridden ride them it's important that you can kind of adjust to different horses because you might have a horse that can do the meter 40s and is great but you'll get on that pony that hates everybody and have a hard time riding it so try riding as many horses as possible and that's kind of what leads me to IEA and dressage for kids uh, I cannot tell you enough how much IEA is beneficial to these types of draw ride colleges. Um, it is the same kind of process as a college and it is not super expensive by any like equestrian means. Um, it is very reasonably priced and it helps you so much. Um, doing IEA the last three years, I wish I would have started in middle school. Um, so if you have not thought about IEA, I would, really consider that. Um, it is very important and is um, actually a lot of things that uh, college um, recruiters or um, coaches look for um, if you've done it before. So if you have done that type of draw writing, um, I would suggest to put your IEA contact out there because IEA really does help you get familiarized with different horses and having to show them um, just after that two minute warm up period. Um, so in terms of scholarships, um, I think it's kind of important to, um, we're not football people. <laughs> and so a lot of equestrians don't get scholarships. Um, I've come across maybe one or two um, per school, but if you go to um, more of an like a equestrian based like school, um, I, there are a couple of schools that will give like 5,000 or 7,500 um, if you come in and actually have placed at IA levels um, or if they know you're a good writer. 
Um, but I would say that a couple of platforms you can use to apply for athlete scholarships would be PEF scholarships. Um, I think that's the Public Education Foundation scholarships. And you can apply to those for your state. Um, you can also go on a bunch of scholarships websites. And those $250, $500 start adding up if you apply to enough of them. Usually you can start um, in the end of your uh, junior year, you can start applying for scholarships. So I would say over the summer, just apply, 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 apply. Um, apply to thousands of scholarships. <laughs> Applying to as many scholarships as you want won't hurt you. Um, it'll help you in the end. Um, and you're probably not gonna have to worry about money as much if you apply to more scholarships. And then in terms of college essays. Okay, so um, this is kind of different based on the school you wanna go to. Um, obviously your Ivy Leagues, you are going to be competing with um, very skilled writers. So not writers, but writers. <laughs> um, so you're going to have a, a different perspective on that. But I would say that there are a couple um, options you can go to. Um, so paper is a free um, tutoring website and you can get a lot of information from them in terms of writing. Um, I also would recommend if you are in the budgetary means finding a college advisor. Um, they don't have to be an equestrian college advisor, um, but just finding someone that can help you with those writer's block and stuff like that. Um, do not make them all about horses. I know horses might be a big aspect of your life and obviously we all love our horses. Um, but if somebody reads through all four of your essays and they're all about your horse, chances are probably not gonna go well for you. So make one about your horses, but more about your passion for what you wanna do, right? Um, make one about your passion for going to the barn at 3 a.m. in the morning because you live in Las Vegas and it's 120 degrees out later in the, in the day. <laughs> Um, or just make one about why you want to go so far in the sport, but don't make it just about horses and make it more about you and why you want to do things and other things you do as well. Um, talk about unique aspects about yourself. So it, obviously everyone knows you're going to ride horses. You're going to put that in your extracurricular section, but talk more about like, you're super funny, you're super loud. Don't make it all about your horse life, make it more about yourself because that's what college um, admission officers are looking for. They're looking for someone who brings youth to their community or, or someone who brings their mission state to their community. Okay, so I cannot stress this enough. Start now. Um, if you are in like your senior year coming next year, um, you want to start as soon as possible. Even freshmen or sophomores, look for the colleges you want to be at. Um, you can start touring when you have time or if you're going out to visit someplace, um, go tour the college that is there. Kind of get a sense for college communities because they are way different than your local high school. Um, and you kind of want to submerge yourself in there before it gets too late. Um, so again, apply for scholarships now. Um, and reach out to coaches if you can, and do not procrastinate. It is very hard to pick a choice about where to go to college, um, but you don't want to procrastinate it. I, I Talk with people, talk with your parents about your financial means, um, but at least apply for a backup. So you might not know what school you want to go to, but if you're, there's, a, there's a community college or there's a state school that you know you'll apply to for a backup, at least apply to those first and make sure you have options. Okay, so on to that topic, um, how to apply for colleges. Okay, so there's a couple of different options. Um, I would recommend your Common App and you're gonna hear this word probably a lot in your senior and junior year. Um, Common App is the platform to applying for colleges. Um, there's about 25 schools that you can apply to, I believe, um, and it puts all your information. It's super easy. You write a big essay and you, um, you fill out all your contact information. It's probably fairly long, um, but I would say 
Uh, that opens, I think, August 1st. So the moment that opens, start plugging in your backup schools. Um, plug in all your information. You want to be on top of the ball game before the ball hits. Um, I would also say, I think October 1st is the FAFSA and the CSS. So that's where you're going to get money from the government um, or from your school and to give you basically financial aid. And I would say to apply for that as soon as possible um, because that is a need-based and first come first serve. And then some schools such as the UCs and I think Georgetown um, have their own application. And I apply to those, you would have to apply to those during their own separate application. What you can do now, um, even though the Common App and the FAFSA haven't opened, is start writing your big essay. So you have a Common App essay that is going to be um, about 600 to 750 words. And you have a, a variety of prompts and you can actually go look them up or you have one that basically says, do anything. So you can start thinking about ideas on what you wanna write about. Um, and this is really hard. Um, essay writing takes quite a while when it's about your future. So if you can start now and have it um, like in your pocket, that way you don't have to worry about writing a whole essay. Um, because your schools are going to give you another four essays to write about. Um, have that Common App essay ready, or at least a couple ideas brewing um, for now. And I think, yeah, I think um, if Beth and Mimi have anything to add, and then we can open up for questions. Yeah. Um, Do you want to go, Beth? Or yeah, um, I would say one of the best places to go is the U.S. Equestrian Federation, USEF.org has a college search site and you put in, you go to the college search and you put in your degree you're interested, you put in the location, you put in what you want and you can redo this several times. So you can go for a big school, a small school, you can go for this major or that major and it will give you ideas on what colleges are out there that have writing programs that have writing availability. It's a very, it's free, it's a very good search engine. And uh, there's a lot of information on there that you, know, you just have to put in what you want and, and then try different, try different, you know, scenarios of what you might, might want and see what colleges it comes up with. But that would be a, a good resource for people. Um, if you're interested in the dressage program, um, go to teamdressage.org and that will give you um, the... Uh, all the different uh, or .com actually it is. I'll put it in the chat. Um, that would that would give you all the different schools that have a dressage team. If you go to the IHSA website, you can find all the member schools for the IHSA. I'm sure you can for NCEA and everything else too. So going to those websites will give you an idea of what schools are members, and then you can look into those a little bit more. The USEF website will tell you a little bit about whether it's a team, whether the you know the the uh, team is a club sport or whether it's funded, et cetera. So it, give, it gives you in one spot, quite a bit of information. And I will say the other thing is um, in talking about scholarships um, first, I think there are lots of scholarships out there. So like USCF yeah. will have like zone scholarships in our area, our local association. So the Southwest Virginia Hunter Jumper Association gives out annually money to our members. So um, if you are members of any associations like that in your area, you should check with them and see how you apply for those scholarships. Because you can take those scholarships money, that scholarship money to any school, college, university you want to. Um, as a division three school, again, I can't give you money for your riding ability, but you could bring in a scholarship because of your riding ability if you have received that. So that's one thing to know. The other thing I would say is um, make sure you really check the bottom line. So as you talked about like the FAFSA piece, which helps with scholarship and things like that, you wanna look after all those pieces come together and you're finalizing your schools and looking at financials, um, look at the bottom line because sometimes some schools will have a lower sticker price. Uh, 
and give you a smaller scholarship um, at, compared to a school that has a big sticker price and gives you a big looking scholarship. But when you look and compare the bottom line, it might be surprising to know which one actually is the more affordable school. So I would really, really recommend you kind of think about that. And typically you're not able to really know all those things until after your FAFSA has been put in place and those things. Um, the other thing I will say is schools really do like you to contact them and they do that in different ways. So some schools will have recruit me forms. And again, um, we are always looking for students within like IHSA and, and the other associations, students of all different levels. So not just the top level and the recruit me forms that might be associated on their athletics page um, will let you reach out to the coach. Um, I will tell you also with that, if you are reaching out to a division one school, they can't contact you until your junior year. So keep sending them emails, but don't expect anything back <laughs> um, really until you get to that junior year. The other thing is, as you're looking, I totally agree with everyone to say, find your academics first, find what you're interested in, find the, the, um, core values and what feels like home to you. And then you can find the equestrian piece within that. Um, and part of that might be that some of the schools to kind of give you a little sneak peek of it, um, go and visit when the students are there, um, go and visit the stables. Um, and if they offer things like camps or clinics, sign up and participate in those. Um, it'll give you a chance to sort of, again, meet the coaches, see the horses, see how long of a distance it is to drive back and forth from the stables and things like that to the dorms um, and, and have a good time as you're learning about the different colleges you might um, want to attend. So those were some of the things I wanted to make sure I got to say. I'm going to interrupt. So Georgia, were you about to speak when I interrupted so rudely? <laughs> you're okay. <laughs> Um, so a couple of things that you can do is there are things such as um, APs, which are advanced placement, and those can also reduce um, money. So you can apply for AP English language, AP English literature, um, your AP sciences, AP chemistry, um, which are college-based classes. And usually um, you and accumulate all this information and take a test at the end of the year. And if you pass with a three, four, five, depending on the school, um, they will give you the credits for that class. And that means you could take a couple thousand dollars off your tuition. Um, so that is another option. Um, also with, along with AP, there's dual enrollment, um, which you can take based on your like community college and see if they also offer um, those classes to high school students. So your English 101, your English 102, um, your science, and so on. And then um, as per go for the academics, I think um, that's really important. Um, you can also, if you want to ride in college, but your school doesn't have a team, um, there might be a stable nearby or a couple barns nearby and you can reach out to them, see if they do lessons or have kind of like a, a program that you can ride in just so you can get those riding hours in while being at the school that really matters to you um, academically. Um, I would say that I actually am not going to a US school. Um, I applied to a bunch of United Kingdom schools um, so through the UCAS system, which is a whole different, um, system. So if anybody's interested in applying to the UK, drop that below, I will totally reach out to you and contact you about it. Um, but I would say that it is a good alternative if you want to ride and go to school abroad, um, riding in the UK is probably significantly cheaper <laughs> than the US. Um, and it is more um, out there. It's um, more considered a sport there than it is here. Um, and there's a lot more dressage opportunities um, out there as well. So if you are interested in going abroad for college, um, let me know and I can um, shoot you an email about applying to schools in the UK. 
Mimi, do you have anything to add? Um, no, I think I think we covered a lot. Uh, like yeah. I said, I think that um, having an idea of what you want for academics helps. I think that if you don't know, because a lot of people will not know soon enough, you know, what they want to study, what they want their, you know, um, their their job to be for the next period in their life, because that changes. I do think a liberal arts college is a good thing um, to have uh, more generalized degrees. So um, you can have an easier time if you are needing to adjust what's going on in your life to fit your lifestyle or what it might be um, appropriate for what you need at different times in your life. So, but um, I think that starting early, getting that information is good. I do recommend visiting. Um, and I think the interesting thing with that is I will sometimes have students that were on the East Coast in Virginia. We have students come all the way from California and have never visited and they come to school, which they are much braver than I am. I would not do that, um, but they are great and find a great fit, but uh, do lots of research, look at things, visit um, when the students are there, ask lots of questions. I know that lots of schools also have um, sort of social media groups within their student body, so you can kind of get to meet some of those students that way, um, and I think there really are lots of different options in regards to riding. One thing I will say, there are some schools that offer boarding at schools um, for your horse, if you have a horse. Um, some schools, they're gonna utilize your horse for other students. Some schools, they are not. Um, so ask those questions. Um, and again, I think that fees for things are very, very, um, they, they just, vary between schools. So you need to ask lots of questions because it would seem like they would all match, um, but they don't. And even within that, there are division one schools that have larger fees for you to participate in their equestrian program than some schools that don't fund it at all. And you might be riding on a club level and paying a lot of things yourself. So again, look for the academics first find the good piece that fits for your riding interest and um, ask lots of questions and to compare those bottom lines in right. terms of finances. finances. I ask, no, go ahead. Who's speaking? Georgia, did you have something to say? No, Beth's gonna go. Beth, go do you have anything to add? No, I'd say, you know, I, I agree. Um, find your academics, find the right mix academically and and then with that in mind then pick your writing options but i i would find the academics first that meet your needs yeah. i wanted to add something which is was you know i graduated 50 years ago so how pertinent this is now i don't know but uh we've talked about the writing part of it we've talked about the ac academics part of it but i think also I think a major, for me at least, was a huge consideration was the type of school. You know, I and I went to Sweetbriar. I knew I wanted a, a I didn't want to be in the intensity of a city. I didn't want to be in the intensity of a, of a huge school where I would just get lost. And I actually did not plan to ride at Sweetbriar because I was an event rider and it was a hunter program. And I thought, poo. Um, um, but what made me very, very happy at Sweetbriar was the academics, yes, and being a small school, I could almost make up my own courses, and the riding that I ended up becoming extremely active in, but also it was the type of school that was right for me, quiet, beautiful, not in an intense environment, um, and that was part of having me be very, very happy at college. And I just want to mention too, I've had quite a few riders that I've worked with to one degree or another in dressage who chose a college that had, a, for example, a hunter program and, and became part of the team and learned how to jump better. Maybe they jumped a little. 
and they had a w wonderful time, even though the jumping wasn't part of what they were going to be doing. Ultimately, they had a wonderful time being part of the team and, and broadening their experience. So um, it's only four years of your life. And I spent four years at Sweetbriar riding hunters and it had the biggest influence on my dressage riding ultimately even mm -hmm. though during college I did no dressage but it it uh, made me it helped to make me the dressage rider I became so uh, you know I'm the riding instructor I work with people riding but to me the riding part of it beyond helping to keep you happy in college isn't maybe the most important thing having had our whole presentation about riding in college, um, uh, let's make sure we're looking at all the other pieces as well. Anybody have anything else? Oh, we have a couple of questions. Uh, Georgia, it's been asked if the PowerPoint itself could be available. Yep, I just talked to Mary and we can share that. for. Everyone. Okay, so Mary, you'll share it. Mary sends out an email after, probably tomorrow, and that'll be there. Now, Georgia, I also have a question on one of your PowerPoints. There was a link, a Google something link. Or what oh, was yeah. that? I totally skipped over it, but that is all the dressage schools um, listed out for you. Um, and okay. I meant to go over that, but I must have forgotten. Okay. But Mary, you... can you take that out and, and include the link tomorrow? Yes. Okay. Yep. So in we have email any that goes out. other questions? I think that's it. You guys did a great job. Not so many questions. Um, well, thank you all very, very much. I hope you remember, was it June 12th, Mary, for Laura King? She's absolutely amazing. I hope you all will, will join us. And um, Mimi, could I ask you to stay on for just a moment after everybody else, else is off? Absolutely. So thank you, Georgia. Thank you, Beth. Thank you, Mimi. Thank you. We had a nice group here and uh, really, really appreciate it.